Good morning. Hey, first time that time. Everybody give Emory a round of applause. She's been helping out on the sound. Stand up, Emory. No hiding. <laughs> Actually, we've got a whole uh, new crew of people uh, that have volunteered and got trained for our sound booths. Really appreciate uh, Clay and Arthur helping out as well. And Gavin. Where's Gavin? Oh, he's hiding. But um, this week we are uh, going to continue on on what may be our most unpopular series of all time, talking about rest. Um, John Muir said this, and if you don't know, he's kind of pioneer type, explorer, uh, national park uh, influencer. He said, thousands of tired, nerve-shaken, over-civilized people are beginning to find out that the mountains that going to the mountains is going home, that wildness is a necessity, and that mountain parks and reservations are useful not only as fountains of timber and ir irrigation rivers, but as fountains of life. I think that uh, he's close, but not close enough. Uh, wh what he's saying there is that uh, the pace of society uh, drives us to something different, and for him, it was enjoying creation and all its splendor. Uh, what he fell short of was, yeah, you can enjoy creation, but you're not even close to what you could be if you were enjoying being with the creator of the creation. Uh, it's just an incomplete statement. Uh, one of the thoughts I had coming up this week uh, was this, and uh, tell me if you've ever related to this. It's, and it's that we work for a lifestyle that we don't even have time to enjoy. Oh, man, there's a lot of head nods there. We have boats that sit in our driveways because we want to use them but don't have time. <laughs> we make plans for vacations that we never make. We long for rest but never seem to find it. But we always have time for one more thing. Uh, I think there may, we may have a problem. So last week... Uh, Chuck Beam, our director of missions, started us off uh, with a very good foundation of what is Sabbath rest. And he said three things. Sabbath rest is, uh, well, we learned three things about Sabbath. That work is only complete once you've rested. And he stated that, you know, when, when God, creation wasn't complete, the seventh day wasn't com complete until he had rested. That man was invited to rest with God. Think about that. Adam and Eve, what did they do on their first day? Did they work or did they rest? Day six, man is created. Day seven is the Sabbath and they rest. So the very first experience of creation is for humans is to rest. Uh, the second thing we do on Sabbath is we celebrate our work. Everybody say work is good. We've got about 30% of us there. <laughs> work should be good, uh, and it's good to celebrate work. Um, work is a gift from God. Uh, the next thing that, that God does is he gives Adam work to do. So we celebrate our work and God's work. Uh, and the last thing is this, and the main foundation of Sabbath is being with God, that we are with our Creator. It sounds like a very simple thing, but how many of you have ever heard more than two or three sermons on Sabbath in your life? And it's one of the very first things that is spoken of in Scripture. I think we are possibly missing something. So do me a favor, on, on your bullets in there, uh, let, let's do a little exercise. I'm going to give you 30 seconds with my uh, handy-dandy stopwatch here. All right. Everybody ready? You're going to need a pen. Yeah, David, I was looking at you, making sure you were going to do it. All right. So in 30 seconds, I want you to write down your to-do list. On your mark, <laughs> you're saying you won't have enough time? On your mark, get set, go. People said this effort is futile. 
15 seconds left. Time. All right. Now another list. Name how God has been active in your life this week. 30 seconds. Go. Fifteen seconds left. Hurry, make something up. Okay. Time. Pins down. Stand up if your to-do list was longer than your God's activity in your life list. Go ahead. Stand up. Mindy, it's okay to stand. <laughs> All right, sit down. All right, stand up if God's activity in your life is longer than your to-do list. All right, good job. All right, y'all have a seat. There was no right or wrong answer there. But the, the rhetorical question here is, where do we find our definition of who we are as people? Is it in our doing for God or for our family, or is it in our being, our identity of who we are? Which one of those comes more naturally? I think we are more prone to define ourselves by our doing. And to sound really over super spiritual, our doing should come from our being, that who we are and who we are in Christ should drive us to do the things uh, that we do. Work is good. Uh, Today we are going to pick up in, in the story of God's people in the wilderness. And um, if you're pretty unfamiliar with the Bible, I'm going to give you uh, a background to this just so you can be a, come along with us. Uh, but God's people have been in slavery in Egypt for 400 years. Uh, slavery means that you don't get to do what you want to do. You are told 365 days a year what you will do. Uh, how far you can go and what, just what your boundaries are. God called a man named Moses to defy the king of Egypt in God's name and ask for God's people to be delivered out of Egypt. Uh, youth kids, what did Pharaoh say? Did he let him go? No? Okay, good answer, guys. So he refused to let their people go. God brought plagues upon Egypt, frogs, boils, turned the Nile to blood. They saw just about everything you could see that should have convinced Pharaoh. Finally, Pharaoh uh, uh, refused to listen, and God instituted the Passover, where all the firstborn in Egypt, whose uh, God instructed his people to mark their doorposts with the blood of the lamb, and if their doorposts were marked, that house would be passed over and the firstborn in that household would be spared. So God's people have seen all these things. They've seen their Egyptian neighbors lose their firstborn and they've seen theirs live. They've seen the plagues uh, affect the Egyptians and not them. They've seen their livestock live and all the Egyptians die. Uh, so God is at work. He delivers them out of Egypt, leads them uh, by a cloud by day and a fire by night. Meanwhile, Pharaoh changes his mind. He says, what have I done letting all these people go? And so he sends his army to chase them down and bring them back. And the people's reaction is, oh, Moses, did, did God bring us out here because there weren't enough graves in Egypt? Uh, so you would we would be slaughtered out here in the wilderness? God responds to that faithful confession of faith by his people, by parting the Red Sea, letting his people pass through on dry ground and drowning the largest army on earth. They're wandering in the desert uh, following God. Uh, they get thirsty. God provides water. And where we pick up in the story, they are 45 days out of Egypt. So pretty much all the provisions that they could have taken them, they've probably eaten all their grain. They're out. They cannot provide for themselves anymore. And they are legitimately grumbling because they're hungry. 
uh, I'm not saying their attitude was great, but they were definitely <laughs> legitimately hungry. And even in this circumstance, God uses their need and their immature grumbling to draw them closer and to refine them into the people uh, that he wants them to be. How many of you have changed? The Bible says this in Romans 8, 29, that we have been predestined to be conformed into the image of Christ. How many of you have been conformed into the image of Christ by easy things? No? What about hard things? Would you say that God's worked on you a little more through hard things? Yeah. Uh, so they're in the desert, and um, they're hungry. And uh, let's pick up in Exodus chapter 16, if you want to turn there. Oh, and also, on, on the theme of Sabbath, we'll, we'll pause right here before we start. If you have a phone and you're reading your Bible on your phone, I'd encourage you to uh, turn that off and grab a pew Bible in front of you. Uh, you can look for your new truck later or whatever you're, <laughs> you're doing right now. Look, let me say something that I've never said before. I get that it's a huge thing for me to ask for 30 minutes of your time once a week, uh, but it's not me. Uh, what we do when we meet together as a body of Christ when we open his word is we are, we're meeting, we're stopping, we're being still, and we're saying, God, uh, just, like, just like Samuel, Lord, your servant is listening, speak. Let's stop and, and listen here. So Exodus chapter 16. They set out from Elam, and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is in between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we have died by the hand of the Lord in Egypt. Oh man, wouldn't you like to travel with these people? Would that we have died by the hand of the Lord in Egypt when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I am about to rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day, that I may test them whether or not they will walk in my law or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. So Moses and Aaron said to all the people of Israel, At evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because he has heard your grumbling against the Lord. For what are we that you grumble against us? And Moses said, when the Lord gives you in the evening meat to eat, and in the morning bread to the full, because the Lord has heard your grumbling, that you grumble against him, what are we? Your grumbling is not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses said, say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. And as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. Let me ask you something. We're, we'll stop at verse 11. Do you think these are the kind of people that deserve to see the glory of the Lord? This is all grace. They have not done anything to earn or to, uh, to see God's activity. They've already seen everything that happened in Egypt. They've seen the biggest army in the world drown in the Red Sea. Uh, they've seen bad water turn to good water uh, by God. And yet God is gracious and continues to show them. Verse 11, And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. In the evening, quail came up and covered the camp, and in the morning, dew uh, lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine, flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. When the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded, uh, has commanded. Gather it, each of you, 
as much as he can eat. You shall take an omer, which I think is about, um, yeah, it's between two and four quarts, I believe, so it's a lot that they've gathered. Uh, You shall take an omer according to the number of persons that each of you has in this tent. So for me and Lindsay, that'd be like 18 omers, whatever an omer really is. Uh, And the people of Israel did so. They gathered some more and some less. But when they measured it with an omer, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever, whoever gathered a little had no lack. Um, Bill and I were talking about this this week, and kind of what, what we think happened, really this is what Bill said, um, was that this would be something like a multiplication miracle, uh, that whether in your bushel you had over and over, when it went into the measurement, it was exactly an omer. And if you had whatever you grabbed, if it was just a little, it came out to just as much. So this, they were seeing this happen. And by the way, let me weird you out real quick. When I was in Nicaragua, uh, I don't know if Matt saw this or not. Maybe you were standing there, Matt. Uh, but we were feeding a village one time, and they have this giant wok you bring out and a bunch of water, and they, they uh, cook rice and chicken and vegetables I remember standing in line there feeding people because they come up with Frisbees or bowls or whatever it is they could, they could get to hold food in. And there was this line of probably about 25 people left. I looked down in the wok or the, the cooking bowl, and our interpreter's name was Roger. I said, Roger, there's, there's not going to be enough for these people. And he said, oh, there's always enough. Don't worry. And sure enough, all these people came through full bowl, Every single one of them. Last person comes. I'm so busy just, just, uh, just handing out food. The last person's in line. One big scoop. Nothing left in the pot. Nobody left in line. And like I stop and I think about that all the time. I'm like, man, uh, we are so blessed here that, uh, you know, I mean, it just gives me goosebumps thinking about it. Uh, but God is active and he takes care of his people. Um, I've thought about that so many times, but this is, this is what's happening here. This, there's just enough for everybody. God is taking care of his people. Uh, so whoever gathered little had no lack, and whoever gathered much had uh, plenty. Each of them gathered as much as he could eat. And Moses said to them, let no one leave any of it over to the morning. So think about that. These people are griping about ha- not having enough food. <laughs> now you got to eat it all. Don't you leave any of it. But they didn't listen to Moses. Some left part of it till the morning, and it bred worms and it stank. And Moses was angry with them. Morning by morning, they gathered it, each as much as he could eat. But when the sun grew hot, it melted. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much, two omers each. And when all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, he said to them, This is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Okay, how many of you have ever driven to Colorado? Okay, a few. So these people are in the wilderness, and God is telling them to stop. Where are they on their way to? They're on their way to the promised land, a.k.a. Colorado for me. Um, And this is like God telling you to stop and spend two days in Amarillo, okay? This is just not, this just doesn't make sense, okay? Um, Stop, stop here in the desert, in the, you know, why? We're, We're on our way to somewhere. Why wouldn't we just power through and keep going? But no, God says to stop. This is the first time in the Bible the word Sabbath is used. This is where God commands the Sabbath for the first time. He demonstrates it in creation. But this is the first time in the Bible that Sabbath is used. In the wilderness to these grumbling, bellyaching people, God is still faithful to say, I haven't given up on you. I still have something to show you. It's up to you whether you listen or not. So verse 22, and then we'll finish out. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, two omers each. And when all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, he said to them, 
This is what the Lord commanded. Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake and boil what you will boil, and all that is left lay over aside to be kept till morning. So they laid it aside till the morning as Moses had commanded them, and it did not stink, and there were no worms in it. Moses said, eat it today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is a Sabbath, there will be none. On the seventh day, some of the people went out to gather, but they found none. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, on the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. Remain each of you in his place and let no one go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. Will you all join me in prayer this morning? Oh, God, help, help us to, to learn how to rest and to trust in you. Um, Lord, we confess that we are more like these people than we are unlike these people. Uh, that we struggle to trust you to provide. We struggle to trust you that we can stop and rest in you. Lord, help us to uh, trust you. To lend all of ourselves over to you. To, when we say, Lord, we really mean, mean it. Lord, may the words of our mouths and the meditations of our heart be pleasing and acceptable to you. And Lord, our rock and our redeemer. We pray this in your name. Amen. So these people were growing hungry, wondering why God had dragged them out into the wilderness away from their good way of life in Egypt. You know what that says to me? Keith Green has a song that is titled, So You Want to Go Back to Egypt? <laughs> so you want to go back to Egypt where you're warm and secure? Uh, yeah, you're secure, but you're a slave. Uh, and, you know, uh, sometimes we remember our past and when we were wandering away from, it, from God a lot better than it really was. I think that's what, what's happening here. But let me ask you this. Have you ever questioned the goodness of God? At, at the foundation, that's what these people are doing. Uh, you've brought us out here to die. You're letting us starve. There's no water to drink, but what does God do every time? He provides, he provides, he provides, and they, they don't see God. They just don't. The Bible says that the whole congregation of Israel was grumbling. Think about that. I don't know. We got a few pastors in the room, but I don't, how would y'all feel about being a whole congregation of people who are grumbling? I'd leave. <laughs> They'd be the reason I wanted to go back to Egypt. Uh, when I was a teacher, and no offense if you were one of these teachers, but sometimes there was people in the break room that complained. I just wouldn't even go in there because I didn't want to hear it. Being around grumblers isn't something that's pleasant at all. And this is the attitude of these people. You know what, you know what the defining theme about these people of the Exodus are? That they were grumblers, that they were complainers. Ugh, who wants to be around people like that? And I think about how God is persistently good and gracious and patient and kind to these people. And what we see as the story develops is that there is more than one way to question the goodness of God, isn't there? So they question, have you brought us out here to starve? And then later in the story, what do we see that happens on the seventh day? These people go out even though they've been provided on the day before with two days of food. They still go out because they don't trust in the goodness of God. So Moses is being led by God. The people are hungry. God provides man in the morning, quail in the evening. And uh, manna is something that can be baked down into bread. Regardless of what it was, God is sustaining these people. And why is God doing this? Look with me at verses 3 and 4. So God is sovereign over everything. Uh, he's in control over everything. He knows everything. He can provide anything and everything. Uh, he knows they're out of food. So what is God up to? Verse 3 says this. The sons of Israel said, 
Would that we have died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt when we sat by the pots of meat and when we ate bread to the full. For you have brought us into the wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall, shall go out and gather a day's portion every day. Why? What does it say? That I may test them. That I may test them whether or not they will walk in my instruction. One of the confessions that uh, kind of popularized by Henry Blackaby is that God is always work around, at, at work around us. Uh, is God complete in who he is? What do y'all think? Is God growing and learning and developing? No. Uh, one of the great questions that was brought up by Carter at our uh, men's group, Carter, if you want this question answered, here it comes, is that uh, how is it that, that God existed and he was never created? Well, the answer, part of the answer to that question is this is that God is holy, the way the Bible describes him, and we sing it, holy, holy, holy. What does holy mean? It means that he's separate and different and one of a kind. There is no perfect analogy to describe God because there is only one of him. There is only one like him. So God is the unmoved mover. He's the uncreated creator. He is one of a kind, literally. Everything flows from him. And all kinds of science and everything says that there was a definite point to the universe and that can only be started by a creator. Why does that make sense? Because God is separate and different. Nobody made God. One of the, one of the things that we need to know is that even though God is complete, his people aren't. And so one of the things we read in scripture is that God is constantly testing his people. Y'all remember the story of Gideon? where I think Gideon starts out with something like 30,000 soldiers. And, uh, and Gideon says, well, God, if you're with me, make this side of this, uh, this blanket dry and the other side wet. And so God does it. And then he, he gives God like three tests. And God passes every test so Gideon knows that God is with him. But at the end, God takes this army of 30,000 people and wills it down to 300. Why? Are we the ones who should be testing God? <laughs> no, God is testing us. He's refining us. He's wanting to know what's in our heart, who we are, uh, revealing to us who we are. God has brought them to this circumstance on purpose to test them. God wanted to know whether they would trust him or not. God is taking them to a, the promised land. And this promised land, yes, it's flowing with milk and honey, but it's also filled with really bad guys that they're going to have to go to war with. And if they can't trust him to provide bread and water, um, they're not going to do real well here. God is inviting these people to come and rest. So let, let's look about how this matters. Uh, so the question or the statement today, number one, if we are going to rest in relationship. We must learn to trust in our provider. And I wanted to be a little candid with you all this morning. The, the statement is, if we are going to rest in what? In relationship. When we rest on the Sabbath, are we resting in the Sabbath or are we resting on the Sabbath? We are resting in God on the Sabbath. Uh, Pete Scazzaro says, well, if... If you just call, if you just consider your, uh, you know, your day off to be your Sabbath, that's called a bastard Sabbath. It's not really what God intends it to be. Um, it's not fulfilled. The only true rest is when we rest in God. So I, I wanted to read to y'all, um, this is my prayer journal. And most of this is confidential, so if you find this, don't open it and read it. Kind of something I realized, I think it was yesterday or Father, is it true that I only spend time with you in order to make myself productive? I feel like I need you to help me 
uh, to do whatever you have called me to do, but something is out of alignment. Something is missing. Will you tell me? Will you show me? Why did you call those people out of Egypt? Uh, Is this what I'm doing now? Lord, I refuse to use you to get myself ready to do my work. You are my priority. Your priorities are my priorities. You, Lord, by your Spirit, can accomplish everything. Apart from you, I can do nothing. What does this really mean? It means I don't get to spring off of the vine, John 15. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do what? Nothing. I don't get to spring off of the vine after I've been there abiding for a while. It means that I stay. It means that I am given by you what I need to do to bear fruit. It means that I don't get to use you to become a productive plant all by my own. It means that I can never leave you and expect anything worth having. You give life to everything. My confession is this, is that I've been using God even to do ministry, and it kind of repulsed me that I need to be productive. I know that I can't do that unless I have a quiet time. Uh, <laughs> and what that practically what that means is that I'm making my own to-do list and saying, God, help me do what I want to do. Not saying, not my will, but your will be done. This is, this is what's rest. When God calls you to something, he equips you and gives you what you need to do it. <clears throat> so if we are going to rest in relationship, we must trust in our provider. Does that mean that we become lazy people? Is that what I'm talking about, stopping and resting? No, Paul said, let the man who does not work not eat. Okay? Paul was not a communist. <laughs> I don't know if you're you're aware of that. Um, But what is the lie that we believe about not resting? Why did those people go out on the seventh day and gather when God provided them double on the day before? It's that if we rest, we will get behind. So we plow through and we allow expectations to be established that are not good. Guess what? When you answer a phone call at 8.30 at night, and you don't have to, that just became the new expectation for how work is going to work in your life. When you answer emails at 11 p.m., you're expected to answer them at 11 p.m. I'm not Tyler McKinney life coach. That's not what I'm here to do today. Um, But What I'm saying is this trying hard isn't getting us anywhere, is it? It reminds me of uh, what, uh, what Bum Phillips said about the Houston Oilers in the playoffs. He said, uh, it was like the harder we tried, the behinder we got. Is that not true about you? (laughs) Oh, if I could just, if I could just plow through all the way till July, I'll get ahead and I'll have some time to rest. Ain't going to happen. Ain't going to happen. How does, how does work, work reward you for being productive and efficient and good? Man, you really knocked that out. I think we can give you some more work. (laughs) Yeah, meanwhile, you're, you're, you don't know what your kid's favorite color is. I mean, what are we doing? Uh, we have to stop, and I'm not condemning. I'm not condemning work at all. What I'm saying is that if we allow boundaries to exist that are unhealthy, then people will, will go with it, and it's our fault. Uh, let's turn to Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 2 and 3. And this kind of further clarifies why God's doing what he's doing here. Verse 2 reads like this. And this is the generation. These are these the, the people of the Exodus that saw their parents die in the wilderness. They're being told this story. So they wouldn't do what their parents did. Verse 2 reads like this, And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor nor did your fathers, 
that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So rest is a heart test. God wants you to know that it's not by what you do or what you can provide for yourself, uh, but by his word and by his provision that true life really comes. How are you responding to the test of rest? How are you responding to the test of rest? Secondly, if we are going to rest in relationship, we must recognize stopping and resting as a faithful act of worship. Uh, Look with me at verse 23, Exodus 16, verse 23. Then he said to them, this is what the Lord meant. Tomorrow is a Sabbath observance, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. So a Sabbath rest isn't necessarily just a break for you. This is an act of worship, something that you're doing towards God. Tomorrow is a Sabbath observance, a holy Sabbath of the Lord. Bake what you will bake, boil what you will boil, and all that is left over put aside till morning. You know, this is something that's extremely difficult. It's easy to take a day off. It's hard to to take a day off and Sabbath and rest and direct your mind and heart towards God when you stop. You know why? Because you're so dang tired and worn out. You know, sometimes the most godly thing you can do is take a nap, okay? Um, It's in the Bible. Uh, But what do we do? What do we do when we stop? Is it not the, the song you learned in vacation Bible school or in Sunday school growing up? He's got the whole world. Y'all sing with me. In his hands, he's got the whole world. In his hands, he's got the whole world. In his hands. It's hard for us to imagine that rest is a literal act of worship. It is so foreign to us. And not only that, it's a command. Now, Chuck talked about yesterday, basically in the New Testament, says it doesn't matter when you Sabbath. One day is good as another. I used to do it on Thursday evenings and Sunday evenings just because I didn't, when I was working two jobs, I didn't have time to dedicate a whole day. But you know what? That was scheduled rest. That was my time when I said no to everything. (laughs) I don't care. Do you have something scheduled? Yes, rest. The answer to anything you ask in this time period is no. Uh, That's going to be eating popcorn, watching movies, enjoying a meal with my family. It's anything but work. And guess what? God said that that's good too. It's hard to imagine rest as an act of worship because rest is non-activity, right? Or is it? It's laziness. It's getting behind. It's losing ground. Uh, But one of the things I I think I want to warn of today that in the New Testament, Paul talks about having a seared conscience. You know what that means? That means that you've done something or persisted in it for so long that your conscience doesn't even recognize that it's a sin anymore. Um, We don't want to get there. We need to stop, celebrate, break bread with thankful hearts, and ultimately say, oh God, thank you, you are good. In your bulletin, let's, let's, let's pull this out here. I'm not trying to be novel, uh, but what we have here is Sabbath bingo, okay? I want you all to look at that. Tell me whether any of these things would make your life worse. Somebody said, yeah, that one about cooking a meal with a kid, that would be bad. <laughs> look, look through them. Would it make your life worse if you didn't watch or listen to or read any news? Would it? Really? Uh, Would it make your life worse if you listened to a book of the Bible in one sitting? Uh, Would it make your life worse if you spent five minutes in silent solitude? 
Would it make your life worse if you fasted from media and screens for half a day or all day or didn't watch TV for a day? Would it make your life worse? Would it make your life worse for you and your spouse to have an uninterrupted conversation or you and a good friend to have an uninterrupted conversation? Danny, is that hard to find, uninterrupted conversations? It's hard to find. Why? Because we let it be. And this is terrible preaching, but when we don't listen to God's commands, we breed worms and we stink, okay? <laughs> it just doesn't work. Uh, one of my favorite teachings that, that Bill has brought here is that in the Bible, God tells us what works. God knows what works. And when we try other things, we find out what doesn't work, don't we? But we, we're, we're more prone to listen to things like a rolling stone gathers no moss. Idleness is the dead, as Benjamin Franklin, idleness is the dead sea that swallows all other virtues. Idle hands are the devil's playthings. That's not what rest is. Rest is not idleness. That's not what, what uh, God's talking about here. Uh, rest is resting in God and looking forward to the confession that he has the whole world in his hands, and that's a good thing. Lastly, this. If we are going to rest in relationship, we must be intentional about boundaries. We kind of already hit on this. Um, boundaries are good. Limits are good. Think about the Ten Commandments comes right after this. Do you think the people of Israel were disappointed that they were given these laws? You shall have no other gods before me. What, what would it be like for you? Uh, what if God was like this? What if God, when you got to heaven, uh, you, you, were with, you were with these people, and God didn't say anything about there are no other gods besides me. Worship all the idols you want. And God just said, yeah, I just thought it'd be funny to watch you, you know waste your whole life doing that. No, that's a good thing. Do you think any of the people were, were disappointed? Man, I really wish I could have murdered somebody. You know, you really, really ruined my life, God. Thanks. Uh, you know, what, what about adultery? You know, you, you wish God would just let us just flat out ruin our lives? I mean, God is protecting his people with these boundaries. Boundaries and rules and borders and limits are all good things. For you, it may be uh, when you get home, uh, maybe you turn off all devices for three hours. If you have to check your email, check it before bed. I know some pastors that charge their phone in a different room because they can't sleep because they're contacted so often. So they just said, whatever it is, can wait until morning. If it's really bad, they'll knock on my door. Um, maybe you need to buy an old school alarm clock. You know, that kind that your parents all had that were, you know, that fake plastic wood with the red letters that lasted for 400 years. Y'all still have that? <laughs> this is the pilot. <laughs> this is funny. Whatever you need to do, one common denominator as we've talked about this and we faced resistance to this is that a lot of it has to do with being connected. The, th the kind of the world we live in is with a phone. You can do anything all the time. You can solve any problem all the time. You can get in touch with anybody all the time. And I, I just say that's not necessarily a good thing. That's, it's impossible to rest when you're connected 24-7. If you fail to plan, though, you, you plan to fail. Um, the emphasis of Sabbath is a confession that we are failing to listen to God and trust Him as our provider. And what are we missing? We are missing relationship with God and one another. I want to close on this. What, what is the truest me message of Sabbath? Uh, Joe read it earlier in John chapter 6. Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven. Jesus talking about himself. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. Tough question. 
Does the activity of your mind and heart and life, is it a confession that you are satisfied? Is it a confession that you are resting? If not, we may have to confess that there's something that we don't know about God that we just haven't figured out yet. And when you do rest, are you resting in Jesus? The question that started this conversation was this, what must we do to be doing the work of God? The work of God is to believe in Jesus. The life, the crucifixion, the resurrection, and the everything that follows through that. If you've been living a life that has absolutely no rest, you can't, you can't say that you're doing it God's way. If like me, you guys, I, I've been still, I've been waking up at 3 a.m. for about six months. That's not good. I'm not standing up here saying I figured it all out. What I'm saying is I've, I've come across myself a problem and I see the problem everywhere I look. It's not good. That's anxiety. Anxiety is saying that you, you, there's something about you that you just, you're, you're holding on to. You can't figure out on your own. The Bible says, come to me and I will give you rest. We don't have to figure it out. We have to trust. We have to stop. Be still and know that I'm God. That is very counterculture for us. I know this isn't popular. I don't like doing it. <laughs> I don't like saying this stuff. Um, but we're going to preach all of Scripture. We're going we're to teach all of it. And as a church, we need to figure out how it is we rest. You all join me in prayer. Lord, I think all I can ask is that you help us figure it out. That, um, that you show us avenues for rest, that you help us be creative to find rest, and that when we do rest, our rest is a confession to you. Uh, it's an act of worship to you. Lord, help us to slow down, uh, to not miss it. Or if there's someone here who has no rest in their spirit at all because they don't know you, I pray that they're led by you and drawn to you. And Lord, they, they come to you and they find rest. We pray all this in your name. Amen. Will you all stand with me this morning?